Um, thank you very much, guys. Sorry for the slight technical lag. This is what happens when you are the event host and you give a talk. The cobbler's children has no shoes, and the, uh, the host has no one to host him. Um, so I, I'm, I'm following in a sort of similar vein. I won't say that what I'm about to talk about is something completely different, because I want to stay with the notion of basically of electrical, electronic devices and sort of the unintended consequences of those devices. Um, and so for my talk, I basically want to ask and answer a fairly simple yet complex question. Why did the Arab Spring succeed? Um, not necessarily what caused the Arab Spring. I think you know, we're puzzling through that, and I think there's answers to be found there. Of course, you know, they wanted liberty. They were repressed for decades by, uh, by ruthless dictators and their police services. Um, and more recently, I think you know, I, I've seen some interesting research that the Arab Spring was triggered in part by rising food prices. They finally couldn't take it anymore. Um, but why did it succeed? Why, after decades of, uh, of attempting to overthrow these repressive regimes by Gaddafi, by Mubarak, um, you know, there's been no lack of dissent in the Arab world. But why did it work this time? Why were they able to organize uh, almost spontaneously uh, without sort of hierarchical chains that you could basically crack down on if you were the secret police? Um, what made Tahir Square possible? What made the martyrs revolution in Libya possible, besides NATO airstrikes, of course? Um, and there's a conventional narrative built around that. The narrative is Facebook, is Twitter, is social media. Um, those things made it possible for them to organize. Um, that's true to a point, but you know, Facebook and Twitter are, of course, they're software. They're applications that reside in the cloud. You use them on any number of devices, um, whether you know, desktops, laptops, your phone. Um, and, you know, and basically, you know, the Arab Revolution, the Arab Spring as it started in Egypt in particular, was not something that was caused by bloggers sitting at home at their desktop computers on the outskirts of Cairo. Um, it was spontaneous and self-organizing because people had their phones in the streets. So that leads me, lead me to my sort of next question, which is, you know, what were those phones they were carrying? I mean, these are you know, a lot of unemployed, young 20-something Egyptians, well-educated to some extent, but certainly not wealthy enough to walk around with iPhones or the latest Blackberry. So what was it they had? Well, how were they able to, uh, to basically sort of you know, defeat the security apparatus of a, of a decades-long regime, um, or in the case of Syria, are battling it right now and basically are able to broadcast messages they'd never been able to smuggle out of that country before? Um, and this is a answer that, the answer to this question, I think, starts uh, in China, ironically, the place that had done, has done more than any other nation to crack down on its own dissidents in the wake of the success of the Arab Spring. And it starts in a factory, and not this kind of factory. This is obviously the factories that we think about when we think about China. We think of factories like Foxconn, which somewhat resembles this. Foxconn uh, is the Taiwanese manufacturer that famously makes Every Apple iPhone, every MacBook Air, every Kindle, every PlayStation, um, almost every major consumer electronic device you can imagine um, in a plant of 500,000 people. But that's, that's not the factory I'm, I'm thinking of. That's not the one that, that made all the difference. Factories like this with, with workers at endless assembly lines. The factory that caused the Arab Spring looks like this. And if I had a caption for it, it would say, somewhere in the Pearl River Delta. Um, these images were taken by my friends uh, Adam Matthews and Jocelyn Braun. They went searching through the back, back streets of Dongguan and places like that in the Pearl River Delta, where basically people have set up factories in their garages, where they are working away without safety gear, without equipment, um, with using components to assemble what used to be toys, shoes, very low-end manufacturing. And now they're building cell phones. Um, the parts they use may be counterfeit, may be legitimate. The phones they're building may be counterfeit, may be legitimate. At some point, there's such a breakdown in the supply chain that no one really knows what they're building or for whom. Now, there's a word for this in China for these kinds of people, the people who are working away at these, at these factories uh, with no regard. Uh, if you combine the Chinese characters for mountain fortress, you end up with that name. And in English, it translates to, now, of course, it doesn't work, Shanzai. You end up with the Shanzai. And Shanzai has a particular sort of ring in China. It uh, refers sort of explicitly to the sort of bandit kings of medieval, uh, medieval China. Um, this is uh, Song Jian, who was one of them. This is a, a still from his big budget you know, epic in China a couple of years ago. Um, but the Shanzai referred to the notion of that these are the pirate kings of, of China. They basically are operating in total secrecy away from China's own state security services, um, producing counterfeit phones, counterfeit electronics, some of which, which make their way uh, into legitimate supply chains. Um, you may have seen the most famous example of Shanzai. And Shanzai has come to refer to anything that's sort of over-the-top counterfeit. And the ultimate example may be the, the Shanzai Apple Store that they actually opened in Kunming, where you had retail workers dressed in counterfeit Apple t-shirts selling counterfeit Apple products. They had gone so far through that they would come out almost as a legit Apple Store. And that's what, to me, is particularly fascinating about it. 
So here's a piece I read in the Times five years ago while I was still working on my book, or a couple years ago. Five years ago, there were no counterfeit phones referring to China. You needed a design house. You needed software guys. You needed hardware design. But now a company with five guys can do it. Within 100 miles of here, referring to the Pearl River Delta, you can find all your suppliers. Now this is an interesting phenomenon, to say the least. Partly the reason you could find your suppliers there is because of us. It's because the companies that we buy our phones from, the apples of the world, have outsourced their manufacturing to the, to the companies of the Pearl River Delta. So if you're a Foxconn, you need to have all those parts around you. And a lot of them end up in the street. A lot of them end up in the gigantic electronics bazaars of Shenzhen and other places. So the parts are floating around. But what happened with the other part? What happened five years ago where so many guys who are making to toys and shoes in their garages are suddenly making cell phones? And the answer I found out, I looked into it, is the advent of a, of a company called MediaTek. It's a Taiwanese start. It's a Taiwanese company. MediaTek started selling basically a cell phone in a kit. It provided all the chips, provided the motherboard, provided everything you need for, for a cell phone manufacturer to basically stick your own label on it. You could literally just sort of sell a generic cell phone if you wanted with everything that you might expect you know, for, a, for a cell phone. They weren't 3G, they were 2.5G, but you know, if you're selling in developing markets like China, it was sort of the perfect device for it. Now what's sort of interesting about it is, is that you know, they basically, MediaTek focused on the software. So it, it focused on basically writing controllers for its core chip. So, you know, you want touchscreen recognition for your phone? They were working on touchscreen. They were handling all that sort of stuff at the top to create a sort of world-class generic cell phone borrowing from the best. Um, you know, and these are some of the various features. You know, for China, people like to have two SIM cards for their, you know, to swap in and out. Um, you know, basics, a camera, a video, a video player, um, Bluetooth, uh, all the things you sort of need in a modern phone. And while they focused on the, on the, uh, on the software, you, the hardware manufacturer, could focus on the hardware, you could, you could customize. Um, and so in 2004, MediaTek sold 3 million of these chips. And five years later, it was selling 500 million of those chips, half of whom went to legitimate buyers like this. You can't really make it out, but it's LG, Philips, Orange, Virgin Mobile, all the legitimate cell phone players that were trying to make inroads in China. So where did the other half go, is my question. William Gibson said this famously in Neuromancer in 1984, the street finds its own uses for things. And that, to me, is fascinating because this is what passes for innovation in China. So these are Shanzai cell phones. You basically want a cell phone that looks like a pack of cigarettes? Fine, they'll make you a casing for it. You want one in your Ferrari? That's great. Or you want a Dick Tracy wrist phone? Fine, they'll work on that too. And the most amazing one is the one at the bottom. That is a, that is a cell phone that simultaneously has 7.1 channel surround sound built into the back, and then you can screw in a telephoto lens if you want into it. And so you know, the Shanzai Pirates was fascinating what they did. They basically focused on selling to the street in China, selling to the craziest needs that people would want. Um, and the result is, in China, was, was what looks like perfect innovation. Uh, design cycles collapse. Nokia was trying to like, introduce new phones in China every 9 to 12 months. The Shanzai could roll out a couple thousand phones out of their garages, test out the latest and crazy features, and then start producing them by the millions. And so suddenly Nokia and everyone else is tearing out their hair because they're getting killed by Chinese Shanzai phone makers. So they did the one thing they could do, the Shanzai couldn't, and that was 3G, and rolling out a whole new generation of technology. So the Shanzai found themselves in a quandary, like, oh, we're, we're making 250 million phones a year, uh, and now we're running out of market this in, in, uh, in China. So they started exporting. They started exporting across the border to India, where cell phone prices and cell, and cell phone plans promptly collapsed. In the last two years alone in India, there's been a massive explosion in ownership, um, which has you know, led basically in part to their massive telecom scandal, where someone decided to sell off a huge chunk of their mobile bandwidth for $39 billion less than they should have paid for it. And that may bring down the Indian government. But, um, but basically, suddenly the Shanzai are looking all over the place. What do we do with this excess inventory of phones? And so while I was working on my book, try, trying to trace you know, the, the advent of the trade routes to the Middle East, you know, the so-called New Silk Road of, of traders going from Africa to China and vice versa. I saw this headline in the paper, The National, it's Abu Dhabi's national, national paper, obviously. Having estab already established a strong foothold in markets such as India and Russia, some analysts believe China's bandit phone makers may now be targeting the Persian Gulf region. Now this made me think, how are they targeting the Persian Gulf region? These aren't multinational conglomerates. They don't have MBAs working in their departments. They don't have marketing arms. They don't have ways to run campaigns in places like the Middle East. So how were they getting these phones into people's hands? How were they finding out where the markets were? Um, and the answer to that I found uh, on the edge of Dubai's airport. This is the warehouse of Swift Freight International. Um, it was founded by a Uganda named Issa Buluk 20 years ago. Um, his basic stated game was to basically create globalization for the rest of us. And by the rest of us, I mean 
you know, the bottom billion, um, the traders who are basically trying to get the latest and greatest goods into places like Kinshasa and Entebbe uh, and landlocked nations of, uh, of Africa, into Harare and Zimbabwe, where they've had hyperflation of a million percent. Um, and the people doing that are not you know, major multinational conglomerates. We're shipping in things like generators and Trinitron screens and you know, Hewlett Packard printers. I was kind of amazed to see, you know, who, how do you, why are you shipping dozens of printers into the middle of Africa? And who was shipping those in? That, that answer I found here. This is the one, this is, this, this is what Issa Baluk calls the mamas. Uh, they're the traders who get things done on the ground, who are basically local merchants in Africa, who go to Dubai, who go to China, and, and source those goods. This is, this is one of them. This is the only unblurry shot I had of her in Dubai. She was racing around, packing boxes with her assistant, full of cell phones and purses and other things. Um, and when I ended up in Guangzhou eventually, I, I met sort of the other end of this, Issa's brother, Bayram, who was dealing directly with the mamas. Uh, and in these cases, there were, you know, there were basically African traders, some 10,000 who, who live and work in, in Guangzhou, many of them illegally, their visas have run out. And they're the ones who are basically hooking up with the Shanzai and hooking up with the other factories and buying things at wholesale or less and arranging you know, through this circuitous route of ship and air cargo, flying it into places like uh, Addis Ababa. Uh, this is a guy named Ephraim. Uh, this is a photo I took in the Mercado Market, the largest open air market in Africa. Um, you know, he basically sells cell phones, uh, printing supplies, a lot of stuff to the NGOs that are on the ground there in Addis, but also to, uh, to many sort of native Ethiopians. Um, and in my book, this is sort of where I left it. I sort of left it, you know, this sort of way station where other bundles were being sent off into places like Kinshasa, and I never saw where they ended up. And I wonder, I wonder what would change. And then it changed. This is a photo taken, as it says, on day 17 of the Arab Spring in Cairo. Um, this is a demonstration by doctors. You can see people are using their cell phones to take cameras to shoot video. Um, this is an image I took off Flickr, and the, the woman who photographed it um, said that, you know, on the first day of the Arab Spring, um, the police came and, and took or smashed their cameras. And I think she said something to the effect of, this is a, this is a revolution that we followed on our phones. Um, and so I thought, like, you know, so what are these phones here? You know, the Shanzai phones don't sell for $300. They sell for $40 or $50. And I thought back to the features that those phones had that MediaTek was providing, and I thought about it. All right, what do you need to overthrow a dictator? Let's see, dual SIM cards. That comes in really handy when the secret police has one of your identities, but not the other. And you could swap them in and out of your phone or just keep them in at the same time. Um, or, you know, of course, it helps to have Bluetooth. The New York Times reported that basically dissidents were using Bluetooth to basically get clo phones close enough together and then trade files between their phones without anyone able to snoop on the network because Bluetooth only works very locally. Um, or you have things, of course, like a, th like a camera or a thing like a video player or the software to run Skype so you can basically communicate with people in and outside the country. And basically when I thought about it, the Shanzai had unwittingly invented how, like an, a, a dictator overthrow kit that you could basically produce by the millions. And, um, and so yeah, so you know, I think you know, the real answer as to what caused the Arab Spring to succeed is not necessarily social media. That was incredibly important, of course. But the medium, the, the thing that put that in their hands, the message of social media, the medium was those Chinese cell phones. And um, it'll be curious to see as the Arab Spring continues in Syria and where if, if perhaps if the Green Revolution resumes in Iran, um, what role China will have to play unintentionally in overthrowing those regimes too. So thank you very much.